Hey kids, it's time to get some SML podcast all up in that. What's up, everybody? This is the SML Podcast. I am your host, Joe. Joining as usual, Cole, how are you doing? I'm okay. I'm breathing, and I'm okay. That is a good sign. And yeah. you're here. I am. So I that's was a not bad going sign. To be. Well, I was not going to be. So depending on how you feel about my presence, depends on whether or not that's a plus or a negative for you. Win for everyone, I guess? Uh, sure. We'll, we'll roll with that. That sounds convincing. Convincing, yes. Party cast, Chris and Purnell are here. How are you two doing? <sighs> okay, now I'm Hello. reading. <laughs> you have the wrong overlay up, by the way, you bastard. <laughs> oh, I haven't changed the overlay in months. Sad face. I'll switch it. I put there. so much effort into the lovely party cast. I honestly okay. thought it was still on party cast. There we go. Now I'm happy. Party! Party! Making up shit. The yeah, Pernell, how are you doing? I'm off tomorrow, so I'm going to feel good when I go to sleep knowing I don't have to wake up for nothing. Thank you, veterans. And thank you, employment, for finally paying me for this credit. Because <laughs> I used to get, they used to force me off from work, but they didn't want to give me any money for it. So I was like, well, enjoy your day, you broke bastard. Like, thanks. I appreciate that. And by that, I mean, kiss my ass. Um, but now it's like, <laughs> yes, I too am amongst the people who can enjoy their time off from work. I will use it to be lazy as as nature intended. So it'll be great. Chris, do you have the day off? No. Aww. In fact, I'm going to be working extra long tomorrow. But then I will be streaming the entirety of Skyrim because it's Skyrim Day. Skyrim Day. I don't think day. that's possible to do. Yeah. <laughs> Nice self-promotion there, Chris. <laughs> well, I mean, it's just the truth. I mean, if he's streaming it on Wednesday, the episode's not out until late Wednesday, so I think it, he's going to end up missing it. That yeah. was so the, the point. self-promotion doesn't work. That no, was the fine. point. Yeah. That's why I was stating it is simply a fact. <laughs> that's absolutely cold-blooded. Yeah, cold-blooded? That's my new yeah. thing. That's cold-blooded. Eleven eleven is Skyrim's birthday, so Ooh. I will be praying at the altar which of Todd. <laughs> yeah, which one? <laughs> <laughs> Any of them. He's streaming the whole game. I know, like Skyrim on the fridge birthday, or Skyrim mm -hmm. on Alexa birthday, or Skyrim on a pregnancy test birthday. That was, that was, that was the one I was going to say. That was my favorite. I was so tickled when that dude got Doom running. I followed for like three or four days watching him try to get Doom running on that pregnancy test. Yeah, and then same. he did it, and I was so proud. Wait, Doom <laughs> running on a pregnancy test? Yeah. Uh -huh. Like, he managed to get Skyrim, but it was just like a cutscene. But he managed to get actual Doom gameplay. Oh, my God. Yeah. You could play Doom on a pregnancy test. It wasn't even a fancy one. It was like a generic store brand. It, yeah, it was the Equate. The ones, though, that are like digital that, you know, say pregnant or not, said not the ones with the lines. Uh, yeah, the, he, he managed to rig up that screen so that on a Walmart brand digital pregnancy test, he could play Doom. That's impressive and depressing. <laughs> it's like when you got nothing else to do, but you're ridiculously smart. That's what you do. Quarantine, yeah, quar quarantine leaves people with uh, a lot of free time <laughs> to do weird shit. Like, have you ever seen the videos of that dude that rigs up all these machines to pop balloons? <laughs> just, just multiple ways of popping balloons. I do remember the one Thousands. where this one guy made like a giant Rube Goldberg with the sole purpose being to ultimately, you know, shoot a basketball into a hoop. And it pretty much went through his entire like massive like owned the like, outdoor property and it was like wait a minute all this what is it leading up to what is this ball going to do <laughs> you're expecting to like trigger some <laughs> massive like finale and it's like no nah, swish that's it that's the was thing it at least from the three point line not even it was a two pointer <laughs> oh. the, the balloon popping guy like 
He doesn't even go through the effort of creating fanciful machines. He just comes up with different ways to do it. So, like, the, he'll, like, tape kitchen knives to his arms and then squat down, pop the balloon. Uh, just, just a million. I'm pretty sure someone somewhere has a sexual fetish for it. But either way, it's safe for work. So there, it, like, it just took off in popularity. Like this dude just sits and makes videos all the time of a million and one different. Some, some of the ways are are more uh, intriguing than others. Like if I'm not mistaken, there was one where like a hatchet swung down and popped the balloon, and it was like right on top of his head or something, and didn't hit him. Um, but some of them are just very like. Literally just pop the balloon, you know? Pop, 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 pop. I don't know why. That's just all that came to mind. Oh, my God. This show's off to a great start. Hey, man, what can you say? It's a Tuesday. We're tired. We're human. We we are tired. I've been up since, like, ridiculously early because I've been... You know, playing with my Xbox all day. <laughs> Wait, did you actually get one already? Yeah, buddy. I had that shit Somebody pre-ordered. Was... Oh, duh, I forgot it. But it technically had a midnight launch. Nah, mine I opened think... at 10. So that's what I mean by early. Ah. Uh, yeah. See, I'm, I'm I'm that guy. I'm like, you know, <laughs> I wanted... A, it's like, it's weird. I wanted both of the consoles, and I was like, I'll see what I can pull off. Usually I end up getting one or the other. Oh, baby, I got nothing. I got absolutely nothing. And um, at first, I was upset. I was like, oh, you got to be kidding me. How is this, this bullcrap? They, 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 they screwed the launch. I'm an upset gamer. <laughs> it me. He's and then figured. eventually, I was, I was like, you know, I don't really care. Like, I feel like, honestly, aside from the purpose of getting reviews for this show, I'm not really in a rush to get either one right now. Like, after now that the actual period of the event is over for the most part, because even though Sony's is on Thursday, I feel like the week counts as being like, okay, they both happened this week. I'm out of the range of getting one. That's cool. But like now that that's done, I don't feel the dopamine hit you know, rush anymore. I don't want it. Like I'm not chasing it. So it's like, you know, now I'm off the horse. I can wait. Maybe I'll get a cool deal. I'll be the guy that gets a freaking bundle for once. Cause I've never pulled that <laughs> off. Uh, you know, it'll be nice. And the reality of it is I have so many games like, I do reviews because I like the discussion of them. I like being able to play them with the intent being, I'm going to talk about it later to people and not just beat the game in my house. And then be like, that was nice. And you just walk away from it. I like talking about experiences. So that's a large part of it. But if I'm not doing that, I've got enough games to actually play right now. I'm going to die before I get through half the crap I own. Oh, I mean, you're not getting through it. Just, just, Admit it, accept it. You're not getting through your games. It's just not oh, I happening. Have. I've, I've, I've established that I have a library now. And uh, if a person came to visit the house, they'd be genuinely looking at a library. Like, that's what you're here for. Like, check out my <laughs> wares. Where do you, how much have you played? We don't talk about that here in the library. Um, just just look. Just look at it. Um, though I will say the trade-off is also that I'm losing... A lot of the drive for collector's editions, too. Like, uh, what was it? Sakuna Rice and Ruin came out today. And I've been anticipating that for a while. And I was like, oh, I'm going to get the Divine Edition. And I was like, wait a minute. What the hell am I going to do with this? <laughs> What's in here? Uh, soundtrack. That's what YouTube's for. Um, uh, <laughs> art book. I'll look at it once and then put it away. And then it's like this weird bookmark thing. Like, I don't read. So I was like, well, I'm going to with that. Reading? So it, who does that? No one does. I bet. Uh, you already have to for read losers. in the video game. This is true. I just joke about it a lot because I actually started saying it to people. I was like, I don't read, but the reality is I read a ton. I just, I read it in a different format. I used to read novels, but my ADHD wasn't having it. But video game, flashing lights and text, sign me up. Um, but in the end, you know, I, I was just like, in the end, I only want the game. All the other stuff is going to be looked at. It's going to be a cool, nice big box. I'm going to put it on the shelf and never touch it again. Now, obviously, there's certain things where I feel like I'm still weak in the knees for, like, ease or something. I'll get an ease collector's edition. But the average game where it's like, hey, get the CE because we made one. Like, I feel like a lot of that's going to be out the door real soon for me. And I'm perfectly fine with that. Space is a premium, baby. Yeah. 
I know that. I just got my uh, Assassin's Creed Valhalla Collector's Edition today, which was smaller than I expected. I'm not complaining. But does it have a statue in it? Uh Of course it does. I figured it would. It has a female statue this time. Oh, yeah. I want to say that, what was it? It was like one game where they started releasing statues, and they made a statue for each one after that, didn't they? Is what it was. Well, the first game had like a little mini figure with it. Then the second one had a full-sized one. And uh, trying to show this on camera. This is this isn't working too well for me. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the the second one had a full-sized figure, and since then they've all had full-sized figures. Except I think Brotherhood didn't have a collector's edition at all. It was either Brotherhood or Revelations. I can't remember. Revelations, because I have a, my Brotherhood Collector's Edition is right over next to me. <laughs> that one came with a little Jack in the Box toy. Oh, see, I can appreciate that. <laughs> do, 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 murder! Hey, is, I got a question, technical question. Is my mic really fuzzy or anything? I don't know. I'm not little. there to touch it. You tell us. Oh, okay. Why would you know, do? I'm just hearing all this. I'm hearing all this static in my headphones, and it's definitely coming from my end. Hmm. But um, I think that it's probably not. If it only sounds like a little, then that's not what I'm hearing. So it must yeah, just I'm not be too sure. Else. Okay, whatever. <laughs> as long as it's not ruining the podcast. Oh, it's ruining it completely. <laughs> well, I mean, my asking about it is ruining the podcast. Uh, obviously. Ruined everything! Yeah. <laughs> no. Anyway, should we talk about games? We have some games we got to talk about. Oh, I sure. I guess I could do that. Yeah, let's get to this. Maybe we could have a shorter show for once, surprisingly. Uh, No, I'll make sure that doesn't happen. Let's talk about my life. (laughs) (laughs) All right. First game to talk about tonight is called Mad Rat Dead, developed by Nipponichi Software, published by Nis America, released October 30th on Switch and PS4 for $39.99. A rat's dream has been left unfulfilled before his death. That is until he gets a second chance at life. Granted the opportunity to redo his last day on Earth, you must utilize the rat's newfound power to pump his heart in time with the music, lest his own time runs out. Purnell, tell us about Mad Rat Dead. This game is weird as shit. <laughs> but, but, if you're okay with the fact that the game is in fact strange, you will be treated to a game that, well, let me lead, let me start off with this statement. There's always that game when, like, you know, Nis starts talking about, you know, the upcoming releases and stuff that, Always comes as a real shock to me. Like when they were talking about their release, their, their upcoming game log, like the big one that everybody was had on their mind was uh the Trails of Cold Steel Four, and then they got the Mad Rad Dead. I'm like, uh, I'm not feeling this. I don't know what the heck I'm looking at here. It was not quite clicking with me. But then I got my hands on it, and I gotta say, this might be one of the surprise hits of the year for me. I did not expect to like this game like I do. Hmm. Um, to put some context on it for folks in regards to other games that exist. If you ever played Rayman Legends, there had there were those music stages that existed in the game where you ran through the stage and events occurred to the beat of the music. They were kind of scripted, but you almost didn't care because it was like, awesome, I'm running and jumping to the beat. Well, I genuinely feel like the developer of Matt Rat Dead probably played that and said, no, 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 this is this is like entry level rhythm platforming. Let's make this let's step it up a notch. Let's man the bomb this mess. <laughs> and what they ultimately came up with was Mad Rat Dead. Gameplay consists of stages where there's a musical beat playing in the game. That musical track has a BPM, and the BPM determines the rhythm that your heart is pumping. That is the beat you need to use to do pretty much every action that the rat can do. Like, you can kind of do short hops by moving left to right, and that doesn't affect you as far as, like, your beat combo goes or anything, but you won't get very far otherwise without doing real moves. So, to give you an example, the A button on the controller lets you do like a kind of a roll, like a roll forward. If you hold oh, forward while pressing that button, you'll roll forward a bit farther. You do that to the beat, that tricks your combos. Like combo one, boop, 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 and that's you moving. Do, 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 do. And it's really cool. So you have that, you can jump, you can ground pound, essentially. Though it's not so much ground pound as in hurting enemies, so much as just like I need to get on the ground right now. You just like kind of dash to the floor so you can keep moving. Um, and you also have, so you basically have the dash, the jump, and the drop down. And there's also a charge move. Now what that is, is, well, uh, before I get to the charge, I should say this, you can also air dash and you can wall jump as well. Now, back to the charge. 
The charge ability is, let's say, for example, you need to do an air dash. You only get one. So you'll dash off of a platform and you get one air dash in the air to kind of hopefully get across the pit you're on. But let's say the pit's a little longer than you expected it to be. Well, you can do the charge button first, then do the dash. And you'll dash even farther out than you would have normally. And then you can then jump, do another dash. And then at that point, if you haven't included the jump, you're probably boned. Um, so the, all of this is being done to the rhythm of the music. And you're also dodging obstacles and crap while going through these motions. Um, every once in a while, enemies show up on the screen. And to be quite frank, I never truly got the hang of that. I was always just like, well, I guess I killed that guy. Keep moving. But the way it supposedly seems to work is that while you're in the air or while you're in the vicinity of an enemy, you might press one of the rhythm buttons near it, which will then put a cursor on it, for like a targeting reticle, like a sonic dash. And then you do like the next attack, next move button. And if you'll, if you're moving towards it, you'll attack it and kill it. Like mainly by jumping. But I had moments where I thought I was going to trigger it and it just kind of failed and annoyed the shit out of me. But it wasn't enough to ruin the game. Not even close. Um, now let's say you're, you got your groove going. You're jumping, you're hopping, you're bopping all to the time of the beat. And then you miss a jump and you just kind of screw up and you fall and you die. Well, you don't really die because in this game, <clears throat> You can't die because your main character is already dead. So what actually <laughs> ends up happening is when you have a moment that would technically kill you, the game stops and a heart will pop up in the center of the screen with a clock dials in it. You can turn back time as far back as you pretty much need to correct your mistake and then keep the rhythm going. So you can rewind time, redo the, take another attempt at it and keep going. So that's pretty awesome. But you might be thinking, well, if you can just rewind time when you die, where the hell is the challenge? Well, there's an actual clock on the stage that's ticking. And when you rewind time, that doesn't stop the clock. The time you lost on the attempt stays going. So every time you screw up and you rewind time, yeah, you can try again, but your time is still going down. So you ultimately want to make as few mistakes as possible, primarily because the clock is once that clock runs out, then you're done. And that fits into the narrative because technically the way the game is meant to work is that the rat gets one day on Earth to fulfill his wish. And his wish is to kill the scientist that experimented on him in the lab. So think of it, think of every stage as a fraction of the day he's got left before he dies. So that's why the time actually fits in despite the fact he's already dead. I honestly think that's a cool little thematic bit there to justify a dead rat being able to die. Um... <laughs> But it's pretty cool, honestly, because once you start playing a stage and you got that rhythm going, you're like, dash, 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 jump, dash, jump, jump, slap, dash, <laughs> oh, fuck, I died. And then you get pissed off, you got to go back. <laughs> but the rhythm, when you got the rhythm, it feels fantastic to play through. And the music in the game is really good. Honestly. It's not even my genre, and I like it a lot. Um, I will say the only thing that's rough, and it's not a knock on the game, is just be ready for it when it happens is uh, at the end of every set of levels, there's a boss fight. Now, bosses in this game are interesting because the rhythm mechanic that I mentioned before is still in play, but you also are dodging attacks and trying to time when to attack an enemy, and all this while trying not to break your combo. You will fuck up a lot <laughs> if you're not used to this kind of thing, which you won't be because... I can't name many other games that do this, so you're going to die or mess up a lot. Maybe not die in the sense of, like, I just lost the game, but your combo is going to break quite often. Um, but at the same time, there's something kind of cool about it because it adds an extra level of tension to boss fights. You see an enemy coming at you, and they do kind of move to their own bit of a beat, so it's not like they're just, like, erratic, but... You might be, you're used to doing like a normal um, platform game. Enemy comes at you, you jump, you evade it, right? Um, but in this game, jumping needs to be done to the beat. <laughs> so if the enemy's coming at you, you have to know, time your jump. But time the jump to evade the enemy and stay on beat. It adds one more layer that will mess you up <laughs> in the <laughs> weirdest way possible. And then they add more and more layers to the boss attacks. So it's not so simple as dodging one guy. might be dodging three attacks. And you're doing all this to the beat. Fantastic product. 
Um, I it's got style. To, it's got style for days. The graphics are really nice and colorful. Nice. Um, the environments, the enemies are all like these weird, like radical neon, like crazy things. <laughs> like, like you're in the sewers fighting like spiky, like neon paint cactuses. Like, what the hell is this even doing here? I don't care. It's rhythmic, baby. And you're just dodging stuff and bashing stuff. It's. A, I love this game. Like. I did not expect, again, like I watched them play it on the Nipponichi freaking like, you know, you know, buzz reel video. And I did not expect to like this game as much as I do, despite that even. So this is one of those things where I think playing it is worth its weight in gold to really hammer home how effective this gameplay is. It's not like it wasn't that they didn't do a good job selling it. It was just that. It's hard to convey the joy of actually doing this rhythmic platforming <laughs> without experiencing it yourself because it's really freaking fun. And it, I'm sold on it. I'm genuinely so. I'm kind of considering just buying it for a physical version of it. I, I like Buy it that for much. me. There you go. But then it won't be my physical Joe. Yeah. <laughs> I'll let you visit on weekends. Uh, oh, they always got to stall that teleporter. And baby, where is <laughs> well, 40 right, bucks Pernell's, on this one. What do you think of it? Solid buy it. Worth every penny. Frantically fun, rhythmically frustrating. You'll love it. Cool. I am very interested in this one now. You have it I'm on what? my radar. Yeah, buddy. Rats for days. Rats indeed. Uh, next game to talk about is called The Falconeer, developed by Tomas Sala, published by Wired Productions, released November 10th on Xbox One, Series X and S, and PC for $29.99. The Falconeer is an open world air combat game featuring frenetic aerial dogfights and deep exploration of the mysterious open world of the Great Ursea. Oh, tell us about The Falconeer. Holy fuck, this gorgeous game was made by one dude. Yeah, it was. That's insane. I know that I play a lot of shit that is made by one person, and I always harp on what a good job they do. Um, I'm never not going to just be blown away when I have a game presented to me like the Falconeer that plays as well as it does, looks as good as it does, and then you go, by the way, this one dude over here made it. (laughs) You can't help but be like, just fucking wow, calm down, man. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) If if you have not seen a screenshot, a a gif, a gif, a gif, (laughs) I have to force myself to say it like that for you guys. Um, a, a, a GIF, a video, anything of this game, just just look at it. And for all of its hallmarks at being pretty, it sounds just as good. Um, there is a, a world overrun with water. We all talk about how good Sea of Thieves water is, as far as like pretty water in a game goes, right? Yeah. No. You That's like the talk. gold standard. Yeah. And like, think of how many people were responsible for making that pretty water. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then you have these beautiful oceans in the Falconeer. By the way, one dude. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just everything about this game visually and, and from an audio standpoint, it just will blow you away. Um, I do have to be 100% honest. I'm really bad at anything that involves <laughs> flying. And the entire premise of the Falconeer is that there are these warring factions and, you know, fighting for what little bit of land is actually poking out of these oceans. And it's all, um, you know, air and naval fighting, and it's very reminiscent of of World War Two era dog fighting, and it's super cool. But I fucking suck at it. <laughs> <laughs> so that means I have to complain a little bit about this game. I think most people are going to be fine, and I'm I'm very consciously aware. Of how like gameplay that that revolves around dogfighting and aerial stunts and things of that nature is not my forte, but this game was so pretty I couldn't help myself. Um, and and it's not it's not my strong suit. It's not what I play a lot of. I always struggle with it, 
But usually there's at least a safety net for people like me. Um, and the Falconeer does not have that. There are no checkpoints in a mission whatsoever. If you fail, you're back at square one all over again. Ouch. Even if you're set to easy. Now, I will say, it takes a lot of fuck-ups to fail. If you're on <laughs> easy. Not so much the harder difficulties, I wasn't even brave enough to fuck with that. But but on easy, it took quite a bit to fail. It was pretty forgiving with me. And then eventually, it was just like, you need to put the controller down. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but it was frustrating because there, a lot of the the gameplay focuses on riding your big ass bird. I love that that's the marketing for this game, by the way. It's just big ass bird. Um, riding your big ass bird to a waypoint, getting a little bit of story exposition. Somewhere between A and B, you might pick up a, a, a little bit of a dogfighting sequence. You may get to pick up some mines and drop them on some ships. It's all really well done. But if you're like me and you suck, well, it sucks to be me. Uh, <laughs> because you're, you're going to be doing it over and over again. And those those longer wait times from, from getting to point A to B, you can't control how fast your falcon flies. So... You're, you're stuck going at the pace that the game has set. And that pace is fine the first time when you're like, I'm on a big ass bird. And you're just like overjoyed looking at things. But when you've died a few times and you have to start the whole mission over and over and over and over and maybe over again, uh, <laughs> like me, uh, then there just comes a point where you're like, yeah, I get it. Big bird. Let's go. And it would be nice to, to, not be stuck repeating sequences over and over until I'm not a dumbass. No. Um, that's really legitimately the only thing I can complain about. Um, aerial combat, when it crops up, it's, it's pretty well balanced. I didn't find, I mean, obviously with my, uh, struggle with the game in general, just not <laughs> being something I'm good at. I didn't find that it was unbalanced in a way. If I died, it was because I was dumb, you know? Yeah. It was because I was bad and not because the game was, was cheating or unfair in any kind of way. Um, I did like that there were, were different types of missions as well. You're not always just constant, you know, fly a little, combat a little, fly a little, combat a little. Like there are races, there are escort missions, there are different ways that it breaks it up and keeps you engaged it, as long as you're not playing that on a loop. <laughs> um, but yeah, absolutely beautiful. I had such a good time, and I just wish I didn't suck so bad at it. <laughs> I want to give a a quick shout out to GameStop. I picked up my Xbox today, and I was ready to pick up the Falconeer. And you know, day one launch, day one edition. <laughs> I, I dropped the extra ten bucks to get the physical edition with all the goodies that came with it. And they told me it wasn't out till next week. I said, "Oh no!" And I said, "I'm gonna cancel it, and I'm just gonna get it digital later on." Goodness gracious. So. The, there were some really impressive elements. Like, I know that I narrowed it down and was like, oh, it's just kind of like World War II dogfighting gameplay. And, like, combat-wise, it is for the most part. But the way that they have, like, enriched this gameplay to look and feel different while still being so familiar is really impressive. And I say they remember it's one dude. No. <laughs> but, like... Um, your weapon, for example, you're not like, you're on a fucking Falcon. You're not on like a machine gun or anything. This Falcon has a rig, which is a, what they call a relic attached to it. And you have to fly into fucking thunderstorms to charge it up with electric <laughs> that you fire. It's so cool. And like, you can't help but just be like, oh, whenever you're doing this. Oh, I want to see this on the Series X so bad. I do too. And I am out of luck because <laughs> I didn't get one. And I hate everybody that did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we hate everyone that did. Fuck all <laughs> y'all. <laughs> fuck all y'all. I'm the only one who got it on the show. <laughs> hey, well, fuck you. <laughs> well, let's but be no. honest here. If you didn't get one. I we would have been, been on you about it. Yeah. Like that's your that's your whole job is to just have Xbox shit immediately. Um and try. And and collector's editions. Yeah. Like we demand it. Uh but yeah, I don't know I why. just I stunned by the game. 
the the more I played it, the more I was just like, this is incredible if you're the kind of person who's good at this. <laughs> well, then for 30 bucks, what do you say? I'm going to roll with a buy it. I think it deserves it. I know that I'm bad and I'd like a few extra like checkpoints and safety nets for people like me. But for what's there, if you're, you know, uh, not just a complete bag of garbage when it comes to playing fight anything that revolves around fighting and flying, then you're going to have a really good time. Sounds good. I am going to have to uh, cash in some Microsoft reward points and pick this one up. Do it. All righty. Next game is Crystal Ortha, developed by Hit Point, published by Chemco, released November 6th on Xbox One and Windows 10 for $14.99. Today, too, in the town tavern, the Crystal appraisers devote themselves to their business in search of a far-off legend, set off on a journey with four allies who have the future on their shoulders to find the legendary Crystal Motherload. Chris, it's a Chemco RPG, so tell us about it. <laughs> yes, Chemco. Um, yeah, so in the... Um in the endless cavalcade of Kemco mobile RPGs brought to life on consoles and PC. Um, this, of course, they all kind of fall into like brackets. You know, there there's many kinds that sort of imitate each other. And um, this particular one is uh, the series of games developed by, you know, by hit point, which is, you said, as opposed to X create um, X create tends to make the ones that are the most, um, familiar uh hit point really i would say i would trace this particular s flavor of rpg back to legend of the tetrarchs and um monster viator with both of which i've reviewed and one of which i've beaten <laughs> <laughs> and that's good for me because that is actually my favorite set of chemco rpgs is is this set i um i find them really 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 good and um I'll tell you why. <laughs> so this is a uh, like a 16-bit throwback type RPG, of course, with the modern amenities uh, such as an orchestral and uh, rock and roll soundtrack. Um, rock and roll little, for the hip kids. Yeah, rock and roll for the the hip cats. <laughs> and um, but yeah, uh, you know, real instrumentation type of stuff. Uh, pixel art, just stupendous, like excellent, excellent pixel art. Um, you know, it's a top down kind of thing. Um, and battles play out in like a kind of first person turn based kind of mode. And here's where all three games are very much related is that you basically, instead of, um, simply hitting like attack or magic or item, uh, there's no items in this game. You have, uh, the ability to straight up attack with your weapon and, um, that does damage. And then you have a set of skills that you know consume an, uh, skill points which skill points are uh you get you start off a battle with some skill points and you gain skill points every single turn and um just based on how you kind of customize your characters you know that determines how many skill points you start off with how many you're going to get at the end of the turn and how many you get for various other reasons but you know skill points are like the lifeblood of battles in this game because they're they're infinite. You just have to wait to have them. And so a skill that like will decimate enemies will obviously have a larger cost. So you might spend your first turn setting up to have enough skill points to, you know, decimate the enemy on that second turn. Or maybe you're going to spend that turn uh, doing buffs or debuffs or any number of things. Like there's just hundreds of, the, of different skills and different ways to, um, to set them up. And um, like monster Viator, uh, this one, basically has you kind of choose your your list of like your favorite skills and some skills are the same as others but stronger but they also cost more so you know you kind of have to balance all that out and all of that um comes into play in like the sense that you're kind of determining which character is going to do what in order to most efficiently either try to end the battle quickly if you're like just looking to grind or like go up against like a huge boss and not get murdered and murdered you <laughs> will be because unlike a lot of the other chemco games this one does not have difficulty settings um it is just what it is and it is actually on the difficult side um mm. i got I got my party wiped out by a standard battle just because I wasn't ready for it. <laughs> and that's actually surprising nowadays, like in RPGs that just kind of 
at least for the early game, like just hand you all the battles and they're like, well, we'll surprise you with a boss. <laughs> but no, this one's just like, no, nah, you're going to learn this real quick or you're going to just get your ass handed to you. <laughs> Fortunately, there's literally no consequence to dying. You just get an option to either reload your save or start the battle over right there and, you know, just go at it again with a different strategy. So, you know. There's that, of course. And if the game proves too difficult, obviously there's DLC that triples your experience, doubles your damage, or provides you with a white poncho to, uh, to like, you know, soar through the dungeons uninhibited by any sort of encounters. Mm. Um, by the way, ponchos is the slime of the hit point RPG system. They're a little bouncy thing. I actually, um, I saved a picture of it and I'll drop it in chat in a bit. But um, or you could I don't know use it for the pot, the thing. Anyways, <laughs> <laughs> I forgot to load it into Skype like I mean like before the review. So uh, <laughs> yeah, that's the kind of game this is, and this game does not stray very far from Monster Viator. Um, the thing about it is that it's got a smaller cast, and the characters are a little different. Um, instead of being like fully customizable, they actually have some different um things that they can do um it doesn't rely on like a job system or anything like that so in this one interestingly your main character is the best healer and the you know the the um what do you call it obligatory first person you meet who is the lady in the group um actually ends up being the damage dealer which is kind of cool but then she is armed with a shotgun so (laughs) you know and uh that's an interesting thing about this game versus others is that it uh features a kind of pseudo wild west vibe like your uh the lady character i think margaret is her name i i'm not good with the names um she kind of resembles like an annie oakley type character and then your third character t um <laughs> not like the drink but like the golf thing uh he is an uh, he's like the irritating womanizer type you know anime trope um I'm, you know these stories are interesting but they are very tropey yeah but, um, Anyways, he is just like straight up like like Woody from Toy Story. He's just a cowboy for sure. <laughs> and um but then your fourth character is a little girl in a dinosaur costume. So <laughs> this this one like, you know, it goes a little more into left field and I love that. Uh the writing is really good. Like it's actually interesting. It has a real story with real mystery that's going to happen. It's not just people meet each other and have to tackle the ultimate evil. They're actually on a treasure hunt for um, at least the first part of the game. So like there, and it's kind of all about learning. Intr- the thing that links all three of these games together is that a lot of the story is actually just learning these like weird ass worlds that the game has built. Um, there's like all kinds of lore and story and like, it's, you know, all kind of, it's not standard rpg which is what I like. I like learning about like things that I don't, you know, that I can't just point at and be like, Oh, this is from final fantasy. Because it's not. Um, this is, and the weird thing is as well that they don't like pretend that the game is a Wild West RPG. It just sneaks into the aesthetics. It's so odd. Anyway, that's what I love about these games is that they're interesting. And um, yeah, also there's a laugh track, what <laughs> and an applause track. Yeah, the uh, oh, no, I'm interested. <laughs> yeah, sometimes when I haven't seen it since uh, I think Mystical Ninja sixty four starring Goemon. Uh, where, yeah, in regular storylines, sometimes a character will say something outlandish, and then there's just audience canned applause. That's like hilarious. It's I love that game back in the day. It's yeah, great. Yeah, me too. Me too. <laughs> and I just really appreciated that throwback. Also, there's uh, vehicles that you can obtain and, like, ride across the world map, which the world map actually has you traveling, like, long distances instead of just, you know here's the town, it's right around the corner, and then there's the dungeon nearby that you're going to need to clear to move the story along. Like, you know, they actually have you, like, you know, going a pretty far distance, which, again, is great because the game itself um, is built for that because your characters, again, don't use items. So every single battle is a clean slate. You always heal, you always start the battle with, like, everything topped out, you know, no damage, no death is, like, permanent at all. It's just... As soon as you're done, you know, you dump everything you have into a battle and then you come out of the other side of it, like completely ready to go again. So that's what I like about it. So, yeah, um, as far as like, um, 
you know, it's hard to like really say besides like story plot stuff and oh, the fact that like you don't buy items anymore. Uh, I mean, you don't buy weapons. There's no money in this game. You actually just trade materials that you find and hmm. there's limited amount of that material. So sometimes you'll actually end up finding like certain types of ore usually named after the place where you're in you'll find them like scattered around towns like you would potions in a you know in another jrpg <laughs> um but you need those ores to trade for the next weapon and you might have to pick between weapons because you don't have enough ore for everything so oh, that's one of those yeah and it does not have as far as i can tell it doesn't have a weapons upgrade system either so you hmm. actually do like have to plan ahead and you know, look in all those chests. Um, nice. Uh, they were nice enough as well, by the way, to, um, you know, make blue red chests for normal things and blue chests for things that you definitely want to get. And they put them all on the map for you to find. So you don't have to like search every tree trunk or anything like that. <laughs> so, well, yeah. Well, overall, overall 15 bucks on this <laughs> one. What do you think about it? As with the other two, an absolute buy it. If you are wanting to see like the good, interesting side of the endless Chemco RPG mill, um, I like all the games, but these games really super charm me. And like this game is obviously inevitably going to come out on the Switch, and I am gonna like the other two. I'm gonna end up purchasing it with my <laughs> real money and probably the DLC as well. So proud of you, Chris. Yeah, I love it. Go ahead and get it. Um, it's an enjoyable romp. Cool. Next game to talk about is called Superland, developed by Super Games, published by Humble Games, released October 22nd on Xbox One, Switch, and PS4 for 1999. Embark on a valiant quest to save your toy village in the hit first-person open-world puzzle platformer. Roam and explore a huge interconnected world, unlock powerful new abilities, and combine them to overcome imaginative puzzles or uncover shrouded secrets, defeat charging hordes in fast, frenetic first-person combat as you battle your way towards an audience with the Blue King. Uh, our friend Serlina wrote in a review of this one, and this is what she's got to say. Uh, greetings, SML friends and fam. It's Serlina, and this week I'm reviewing Superland for the Xbox One. Developed by Super Games and published by Humble Games, Superland is a Metroid puzzler, Metroidvania puzzler that has you as the red Gumby-like child of a monarchy traveling through the world to figure out why your town has lost access to water. Let's get to the review. In Superland, you wake up from your slumber and find your way to the middle of town where your father, the king, tells you that Red Town, your beloved home is out of water and sends you down a pipe to find out why. Once you're there, the game gives you the basics, including a wooden sword, so it's not as dangerous to go alone. Ha ha ha. There you find out some inhabitants from the neighboring blue town have sabotaged your water supply. From there, your mother, the queen, says let's go, and the game opens up for your adventuring. When I first got a hold of this game, it's pretty easy to think that it's a children's game. The beginning puzzles are all quick and easy. The environment screams cute, enemies and all. At once, I set about to break the game. Hey, sounds like you, Cole. Nothing. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. Cole's like, shit, you addressed me in the middle of a review. I didn't have my mic unmuted, and then I couldn't find the button to unmute it. And I was like, well, <laughs> fuck. <laughs> but that is 100% what I do. Like, if you can break a game, I'm going to be the one to do it. <laughs> Yeah, she says, I wanted to do all the things that I thought I wasn't supposed to be doing and had a blast doing so. It wasn't until I reached the Crystal Mountain that I realized the game had okie doked me. I'd been tricked. The game wanted me to feel like I could break it, but it's a lie. It's much deeper than I thought. This isn't to say the game is hard. I wouldn't say the game is hard. It's incredibly forgiving. There's tons of ways to regain your health, like cactus, fruit, and health regeneration. There's also no fall damage. Even if you do manage to die, you respawn a few feet from where you were defeated. As soon as the game opens up to you, you will see all the Metroidvania elements that we know and love. You'll see puzzles you can't solve because you don't have the thing needed to solve it. You'll see areas that you know are there, but you can't get to them. You'll stress about collecting gold coins for your upgrades. Oh yes, it's all there, wrapped up in a very cutesy way. Let's talk about the gameplay. It's incredibly simple. A is jump, X is interact, right trigger is attack. As you unlock more things, you use more buttons. It's so simple a child could do it. No, seriously, this is a great game to introduce your children to. Now, there are times when they will come to you and be like, parental unit, I am unable to get past this point in the game and I hate it. Then you'll put on your Metroidvania glasses and tell your spawn what needs to be done. 
The controls are super responsive. The only issue I really had was the jumping. It was a bit unwieldy. There was nothing to really indicate when it was time to use your second or third jumps. It's a pain, especially because the game is in first person. There's an apex in your jumping, so you have to eyeball it. That's annoying for an adult and potential hell for a kid. Graphically, the game is alright, although it's so bright, everything is loudly matte but inviting, which is great for the youngins, but it hurt my eyeballs. Also, the opening sequence is quite lovely, especially when you understand where you are. I won't spoil it because it's incredibly adorable and should be experienced. Again, don't let the kitty looking aspect of this game fool you. The design, the puzzles, it's there and it's tight. Superland is available right now on Xbox One for $19.99, or it's a part of Xbox Game Pass, which you should definitely have by now. <laughs> She knows. True, she knows. The Game Pass Alive. Goddamn right, Game Pass Alive. <laughs> should you buy this one? Yes, you should absolutely buy it. There's a robust and fun game here for seasoned adults and tiny humans alike, though they will need some help depending on their age. Once you get past the bamboozle, you'll be thoroughly engrossed and entertained. I have got to give this one a shot. It wasn't really on my radar because of the whole first person aspect. I thought it was kind of like a Minecraft style game at first. But it sounds like it's something I should be giving a try to. So I'm putting it on my wish list now that I'm looking at it, considering they're straight up buying it because of that damn review. <laughs> Do it. I, I downloaded it because of Game Pass, and then I had some shit happen this weekend and wasn't able to play it. And I'm kind of bummed I haven't had time for it yet. Yeah, sounds like it's a good time. Sounds rather super. Ah. Oh, Lord. Anyway, oh, next yeah. game is called Pangeon, developed by Mr. Yatsuku, uh, published by Ultimate Games, released November 4th on Xbox One for $9.99. Pangeon is a single-player roguelike inspired by dungeon crawler classics. Dive right into a dungeon on a suicide mission to kill all the monsters. Brunel, tell us about this one. Well, I'm not quite sure. I'm guessing that they had the intent of this. Well, I'll talk about it before I go on to that statement. That's more of a closer. Um, so Pangeon, like you described, is a roguelike dungeon exploration game first person style um beginning of the game you choose from one of four classes i went with the ranger character um and you dive right in the game will run through a process of generating a dungeon for you to explore and away you go um the way it works is that you have a basic inventory system and you have a main attack and a sub attack i'm going to assume that every character functions in a similar way as far as like having their main attack and their sub attack but in the case of my character as the ranger, I had my normal sword and I could switch to the bow and arrow as my sub weapon and I could fire projectile arrows so long as I had, you know, actual arrows in my inventory to shoot. Um, as you play the game, the idea is you go from room to room exploring and seeing what you can find as you look for the exit to the location that you're in to go to the next floor. When you find enemies... Or rather, they find you because a lot of times I, I have had most open the door and he's like, hey, look, sucker. And they just come at me like, you jerk. Um, but when an enemy comes at you, you are tasked with killing them and you can use whatever means are at your disposal to kill them. You have a block button, too, um, though. I will be honest. I never managed to pull that off in a way that actually made it meaningful. So fun fact, I never blocked the entire game. Um, so. As you explore, you defeat guys. Sometimes you find items on the ground you can pick up and put in your inventory, including equipment like, you know, armor, you know, and such for your character. And then when you find the exit, you move on to the next floor. Every once in a while, when you go to a new floor, you might, you'll come across a man who's offering to sell you some wares. Um, when you go there, you have, you haven't found any gold throughout your exploration. You can take that gold and buy some new upgrades, whether it be armor for your character, maybe an upgrade weapon or upgrade sub weapon or some potions mainly for like healing or for magic or for oh, that was weird um or for just for like a, something called like a strength potion which to be blunt i assume it increased the attack power that you wield it but i never quite noticed i just used it once and then the rest of the time i sold them for money nice cuz i wanted cuz i wanted equipment so every eventually you get to the bottom of a zone and you fight a boss and if you beat that boss, you'll get a decent EXP reward and you'll be able to access the next environment. Um, you do also manage to level up. There's experience points. And when you get enough experience, you level up your character and you can spend skill points. Well, they call them skill points, but it's really just attribute points because you end up spending it on the various stats that your character has. 
And I mean, I don't know what to remember the specific by numbers of strength, HP, dexterity, uh, luck. And I primarily dumped all of mine to dexterity once I learned that all my attack power went to like the bow and arrow. Well, all the bow and arrow power was dexterity. I was like, we'll just put it all in dexterity. Um, so, and the gameplay loop is pretty much just that. You're going from floor to floor, fighting monsters until you defeat, you know, until you find the exit, you reach the next floor, find the boss eventually, beat the boss, and move on to the next area. I did this until I eventually unexpectedly beat the game. Like, I was expecting it to go on for a little while, but I beat the game fairly quickly and unexpectedly. Um, what and do you I will mean say, unexpectedly? <laughs> So I don't know what the level layout was. Like again, this game the whole point of this game is it's just like like you write in the description, like get into the dungeon, defeat the monsters, right? So there's no like layout of where am I going? Wh- who's the final villain? What am I tr- attempting to do? So the last area I was in was a song called the Depths. And I was just running around the depths fighting monsters. And there were a few like mini bosses, like uh, j- two or three giant versions of monsters I'd already fought in the game. I'm like, okay, I'll fight them and I'll win. And then when I beat them and got to a certain area, thinking I was walking them to a, like, a super final boss, it was like, mm, complete, you completed the game. And the achievement game was like, you completed the game. And I'm like, I completed the what? <laughs> <laughs> so it was like, well, I guess that's the game. So. I was shocked that it was over. Um, so the game itself took me like maybe two, three hours. I'm not exaggerating that in the slightest. Hmm. Um, yeah, I know so the, the, the game feeling. description says a mix of many roguelike games combined into a fun, although short experience. So it does warn right. you up front that it's a shorter game. So I guess that would be what it is. And maybe the intent is like, okay, you'll do it. You sit down, you play for a little bit, you're done, you move on. And then you might come back and do it with another character or something. Um, though I will say, you know, length aside, I had one other gripe about the game, and that is how combat broke down. So when you're fighting enemies, like I mentioned before, I had my melee attack, and I also had my distance attack. Uh, meleeing is you swinging your weapon. You have to hit the button each time you want to swing the weapon, which is not an issue per se, just a description. Um, you have to swing the weapon each time to attack the enemies. When I would play this and I had to fight actually melee style, more often than not, it was basically, I felt like I was just kind of like having battles of attrition or hopefully beating the guy up in a way that it was just like, okay, he's not quite noticing me, hit him with a decent strike, and then try to finish the job. But for the most part, I didn't like melee combat. I only I was only good when I was using the bow and arrow, which is pretty much also how I managed to beat all the bosses like I did. I was just like... Mm. Arrows, pew 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 pew. Buy more <laughs> arrows, and just I just steamrolled every boss with arrows. Um, because hey, whatever works, man. Bo- exactly, because I feel like if I had to fight any of those bosses with a melee attack, I would have been done. Like I don't think I could have beaten any of the bosses with a melee attack, and I feel like a lot of that is because of just how melee works in the game. Um, so it's just, that was like a, just the main gripe I had though, you know, arrow combat was perfectly fine. I mean, it worked as I expected it to it did a good job, but it was just the melee that gave me a lot of grief. Um, I feel like overall with this game, if you're okay, like I said, I mentioned in earlier that I beat it in like two or three hours. If you're okay with the fact that you will technically see all the zones in that amount of time, then I think it's an okay run. Um, also, as far as equipment goes, there's, there's only three tiers of it. There's the basic leather. Actually, now I think about it, there might have only been two. Um, leather and then steel equipment. So like, you know, boots, armor, helmet. No. Um, so and that's all you get. So like, there's like, once you've upgraded those, like, well, there was a nice run of air on the equipment. Um, but not much to, with that. So you are truly getting a short but sweet experience. But if you're okay with that, I think it still could be a solid try because I think graphically it's nice too. I like, I actually, that was part of why I was like, when you were like, you want to review this? Like, sure, I'll do a review because I do like the graphic style too, like the whole kind of like flat paper people in a Minecraft looking dungeon. So yeah, it looks pretty I, cool. I was, so overall, 10 bucks, your verdict? I'd say it's a try, but try it knowing that it's, that it's quite short. Cool beans. I like beans, but not so much when they're cool. I like them hot, <laughs> right off the pot, delicious. Hot beans. 
Hot beans, yeah. Next up is a preview of Undungeon Arena, developed by Laughing Machines, published by Tiny Build. Undungeon is releasing Q2 2021 on Steam. Undungeon Arena is a standalone experience that introduces you to the complex universe of Undungeon, an upcoming pixel art RPG with a rich, perplexing lore, intense real-time combat. Chris, tell us about Undungeon Arena. Okay, so, yeah, this is just a um, an early build kind of preview of the game. So it's, of course, they tell you all up and down that it is subject to change. Yes, and, and this is a preview. Preview, yeah, preview. Exactly. So, um, yeah, the lore of this thing is that basically, um, instead of a universe where, like, planets and solar systems and whatnot are, uh, you know, countless light years apart... Uh, this game subscribes to the multiverse theory that actually it's a bunch of universes laid on top of each other that are based, you know, separated by what they call a thin membrane, which I'm like, okay. <laughs> and, um, so, you know, as a, as a natural, uh, consequence of this, um, seven versions of the planet Earth all suddenly collide, um, in the multiverse and turn into one, like planet that you know is basically uh this you know just a big gumbo of these seven like versions of earth and uh of course that obliterates most life and so this is a um post apocalyptic uh, post apocalyptic type of game where um well they call it the shift and uh yeah and so like post shift uh, creatures from these different realities are now kind of like having to learn how to survive together. And, um, of course, part of that is the arena where, uh, you know, hardy fighting types, um, get in there and fight a whole bunch of enemies for money and stuff. And that, you know, uh, all goes to serve the purposes of a nefarious shadowy figure that, of course, you're gonna have to, you know, know about in the full game, I guess. Um, uh, so yeah, you get to pick from two different characters, and uh, they're very different, but you know their their concepts are fairly similar. You're you've got a melee character called Void, who is basically like a Grim Reaper with one of those like bird masks, like you see in like those old like um, you know plague type Victorian era doctors, like you know that type of thing. It shows up a lot in steampunk. Um, but yeah, he's got like this big birdie skull like attached to his face and, you know, he's a, he's a stocky, creepy man. And, uh, well, actually I don't know that he's a man, but anyways, <laughs> it's a creepy thing. And, uh, yeah, it's a melee character that uses claws. Um, and then there is Marduk, which is a robot that what floats around and kind of, all of its it, it's kind of like a golem, I guess, because all of its parts can separate, and there's like just this light in the middle, and that's kind of like who the character is, and that yeah, plague doctor, thank you, and um, that is your distance character actually because it shoots laser beams, and pew pew, uh, so, pew, pew yeah, it's a pew pew character, and so the um, basically what the you know you get to uh, unlock the key to one of five different worlds, but of course only one world is available right now. And you get in there, and it is a kind of desert area where you um, you basically get kind of introduced to the concept of the arena straight away. It's basically something where you go in and you fight several waves of enemies, and if you win, you get money, and instead of like straight up spending money on things, you kind of like, you trade um, you trade items and, and money back and forth, but money's like worth, like a coin is worth more than its, uh, its increment in money. It's hard to explain, but like you just keep dropping coins into like your inven into your side of the trade and it's like 20, 40, 60, 80, you know? And, um, you know, until you have a fair trade with the other thing. And what you do is you purchase items, um, weapons, armors, uh, there's different traders that are on the grounds. Uh, you purchase like, passive upgrades to your character and you're gonna need them because these enemies ramp up quick they're uh, they're fairly difficult um so the presentation it's like an action rpg type of thing you have your attack which depending on your weapon can be augmented in different ways for instance the first claw that you can get for void allows it to do a three combo attack which is 
very powerful if that third strike um, actually connects. And then, um, yeah, it's it's only mouse and keyboard interface right now, so it's WASD for moving, and um, your mouse kind of points you in a direction, and one button like uses your melee attack, and the other button uh, dashes. And all of this takes up energy, which if you use up all your energy, then you gotta like go and find some cover or something and wait for a second for your energy to come back. So while you've got hordes of enemies closing in on you, some of which are pew pews and some of which are melee enemies, some of which are both, um, then you just kind of got to make your way around that battlefield and try and win. And uh, all the while, you kind of talk to a few other characters that pop up every now and then, especially as you start winning matches, and they kind of reveal a little bit more about like what's going on and what different kind of uh, denizens are on this planet. So that is the long and short of it, really. Well, Undungeon Arena is available now on Steam for free. People could download it and check it out. Is it worth downloading and checking out? Yeah, I think so. It's It gets straight to the point, so you don't have to go through a bunch of story. Um, it's definitely, it feels unfinished, but it I think that the core gameplay is really interesting and I like the characters and there is an unlockable character in there. So I assume that there's, there's some more content that, that I haven't uncovered yet. So yeah, I'd say this one's worth checking out for sure. See if that's something you want. Uh, definitely the pixel art's amazing. So you're going to want to like check it out just for that. Really nice. And, uh, Undungeon again, will be releasing Q2 2021 and, uh, hopefully we'll have more information on that as it gets closer to release. Yeah. Cool. All right. Final game to talk about tonight is called Black Desert, developed and published by Pearl Abyss, available on Xbox One and PS4 with packages priced at $29.99, $49.99, and $99.99. The Prestige Edition just launched at retail for $29.99 and includes an exclusive Black Leopard Pet a uh, limited edition glorious Shadad premium set, a 2000 pearl box, a value pack, an enhancement help kit, advice of Valks, and a blessed message scroll. 15 of those that last a hundred minutes. So a lot of time there. Black Desert is a living world MMORPG experience, fast paced action pack combat, hunt monsters and huge bosses, fight with friends in a guild to siege nodes and region castles. Train your life skills such as fishing, trading, crafting, cooking, and much more. Pernell, you and I both checked this one out. What are your thoughts on it? You're a new player to it. I am somewhat of a returning player. I I got up to like level 25 or something, and I stopped, and this brought me back to give it another go. Uh, What do you think of it as a new player? I think this is going to take a bit of time for me to really adjust to because the personal perspective and how my experience is with MMOs. I played World of Warcraft back when it first came out for a good year. I played PSO back when it came out. And aside from that, I've dabbled in multiplayer games, but never the massive multiplayer kind. So diving into this game, I was coming into it with my knowledge of like, okay, well, this is how WoW played out. And I guess they're all just that, but newer now. So, um, I came in this game and I honestly felt kind of overwhelmed at the first, at the beginning of the game. So I'm going to just get it out there now. And this is true for when I played WoW too. The, the, the plot, I, I, I can't, I can't even, <laughs> I can't even attempt to act like I know what the hell's going on. I'll be honest. Starts- every time story comes up for me, I'm just mashing the A button waiting to find out what my next quest is. Cause I just want to run and do what I got to do. Pretty much, exactly. And it's like, due to the way the game world played out, at least early on, I'm thankful that, like, I was going to, that's why I'm glad we're doing, like, bits of this here and there, because I was prepared to have one, like, kind of complaint about the game, but it seems like that complaint may have kind of cleared itself up, which is that at the beginning of the game, when they plot, they, well, the first thing they do is get, like, this whole, like, cinema sequence to lay out your characters possessed by, like, a dark spirit or something. And then you wind up in this Everglade where you're supposed to like go on your first quest. But there was like a hundred people there <laughs> all running around doing the exact same thing I was doing. And quite frankly, I could not follow anything that was being asked or told to do. Like it was just, here you go. So all I did was follow the cursor to a thing, talk to it. They followed the cursor again and just kept doing it until I got the hell out of there. Dude, um, that's what I did for a dozen hours in this game is just follow the thing, hit the buttons, kill the enemies and move on. I like 
I know there are side quests that you can do in the game that different characters have like question mark side quests and 99% of the time I never did them because I was too busy doing other stuff because this game just throws so much shit at you to do. Yes, it does have quite the busy list for damn sure. And um, thankfully, once I got out of that Everglade area and got past the freaking like these like like these quests where they wanted you to kill like these like forest elementals, the herd of players kind of cleared up a bit more. So I felt like I could actually run around and talk to people and find these side quests and start gathering berries and such. Um, so I'm in this I'm in a situation like on like level twelve or thirteen, and I'm pretty much like running around trying to like fulfill a few quests, two one story quests and like three side quests. And then I, funny enough, while I'm talking to you right now, I was like, well, I better put this time to you. So I've just been gathering just grapes and berries and nuts. <laughs> and I've leveled up once while doing it and learned two attacks. So I was like, OK, I'll take that. Um, but I will say one thing that I did like and I think would be better once if it actually gets to the point where I guess he feels like more of a challenge. But I like the combat in this game. Oh, yeah. So, the combat's fantastic in this. Like, when I would play something like WoW, WoW had it so that if you wanted to do an attack, it was like this whole, like, skill bar, and you had to, like, scroll to every skill, and then eventually do it, and that's just how the, that's just how the cookie crumbled. Um, but this game, the way combat works is every attack and move is attributed to buttons on your controller, at least for the character class I chose, which was the Valkyrie. Um... So, for example, one of the trigger buttons does, like, your melee combo. If you hold forward while doing that, you have a different combo. If you use left and right while doing it, you have a sideways melee move. You have a shield bash. You have a freaking lightsaber attack. If you do, like, combining two buttons, there are a lot of damn attacks I got. And I had these at the beginning of the game. Then I learned, like, shield bash and shield counter. There's a lot going on for moves, and if you want to learn them all, I can foresee a good player knowing how to best chain the moves to do the best amounts of damage to enemy types and the like. Um, but the MMO issue when you combine the two things, which is why I'm hoping that later in the game maybe this doesn't happen, is that uh, the early enemies were just kind of like meat meat sponges, like just slash them till they die and get your goods. Um, but later enemies. If the game attempts to have it so that you actually do get to do like skillful combat with them, being that's an MMO, I wonder if they'll even manage to keep up with it about chugging. Because I have had some chug issues as far as like the game loading up characters, models, and uh, but that could also be either my internet connection or the fact that I think this may be installed on like an external hard drive that's connected. I don't know if that would factor into that, but like. Like at least early on, or st- when you enter new areas for the first time, sometimes like the character models take a little bit of time to actually generate. Yeah. So, and that could be a bit of a pain. And I could wager also affect certain enemy combat situations and the like. Um, in fact, there's a fair bit of loading in this game. Um, but mainly when you build up, a, it's mainly when you get to a story sequence and when you boot the actual game up. Um, but I will yeah, the say the initial I- load is pretty pretty long for the initial game load. There's some meat to those potatoes. Um, but, you know, when you're in the game, aside from the models themselves loading up, you're still able to run around and do stuff. So it's not that the game makes you, like, stop and wait for a character model to form. They don't punish you like that. So that's fine. Um, I would like, I'm hoping that I get more of an under. Oh, another thing I wanted to mention that I like about the game, because I do like, I think I'm at this point where I have a mixed bag of, like, likes and dislikes. And one thing that I do like, again, is the the interface for communication with NPCs. So when you talk to an NPC, they will have like a bar at the bottom of the screen that lists a bunch of the options available to you. You use the right and left bumpers to scroll between them, and A to select it. I don't know why that's nice to me, I, but I just like it. It's very you know intuitive as far as like the scrolling back and forth and just like selecting what your option is going to be. But then there's a follow-up trade-off to this, and I'm mentioning it because I'm hoping that the people who made the game are listening and they can provide this detail to us before we get further into what we're doing with this game, which is that the font is killing me. The color of the font is killing me. Text is white, 
it blinds me when I try to read it over almost anything else in the game. <laughs> it is killing me, man. So, like, it'll be a guy trying to tell me something. I'm like, eh, screw it. And it's not because I'm not interested. It's because I can't read it if it's over the wrong type of, like, material in the game world. If it's over something dark, that's cool. Like, someone's wearing, like, a black shirt or some, like, a beige outfit. Like, okay, I'm wearing a beige, but, like, you know, like, burgundy. Like, okay, I can read it. But if it's like, I'm wearing a white outfit, and here's some white text over my white outfit, so I'm a cleric. It's like, well, guess what, cleric? You mean nothing to me. I can't read your <laughs> shit. Um, and you just kind of move on from there, because ain't nobody got time for that blinding read. Um, so, and I have tried to go through the interface to see if there was like an option for like text color or something, and it just wasn't cut, and there was nothing there for that. So you're stuck with white text. Unless there's something I'm missing, because I mean, there's tons of people playing this game, and none of them have complained about going blind. So I'm assuming there's some way to change the color of the font. Um, I I what? don't remember. I know I play with HDR on, so like the colors are a little bit more muted and realistic instead of super bright and blinding. Uh, I don't remember if there's anything in the settings to change the, the text color because there are so many fucking settings in this game and so many menus and so many quick menus and sub menus there. My biggest gripe with this game is the complexity and how, uh, how cluttered everything can feel. Mm hmm. And I'm, I'm experiencing that kind of right now too, because like, I mean, I can't, I don't know how if other MMOs do a better job of this or not, but this game early on, it gives you a little bit of di a dialogue about, okay, if you want to, you know, you can follow the arrow to go to the next quest or press this button to do a basic attack. It even has a small list of commands on the right side of the screen half the time. But once you get past that, the game basically says, fuck you, figure it out, figure <laughs> all of it out. And that feels daunting, even for me. Like, I understand the idea of, like, skill points and uh, crafting levels and stuff like that. But if I don't even know how the heck they access the crafting stuff, what am I going to do? Like, where, am I, where is my goal here? No. So, like, I'm still trying to, like, spot, you know, how to get started with alchemy and how to get started with, you know, what to do with all the, like, this stuff like that. And there's all, like, transmuting of your gear, too. Um that's another thing. Um, I know if you press down, a little black spirit thing will come back and talk to you. And then that screen, you're able to like confirm what your main quest is. And you can also do some stuff related to upgrading your gear. There's enhancements, transfusions, item reform. I have dabbled with the actual enhancement part. And I'm not 100% fluid on how it truly works, but I guess the idea is that you put a weapon in the left slot on like a, a uh, it's like a little, a little bit of an equation where it's like here's one square which has the item and then the next thing is a diamond that has the mod the modifying item and then the final thing is what the result's going to be and you have a chance of it failing and if it fails I actually had a friend explain this to me who's played it on PC before because I was like I don't know what's wrong um, but he <laughs> said you can fail an enhancement and if you fail the enhancement you can actually lose experience for it so it's like it is a genuinely risky bet where wow. you can either enhance a weapon and it becomes stronger or you fail and it gets weaker. Now, there are these items called Cron Stones, which I did get with this, with the, with the code that they gave us. And those code, those Cron Stones, or I guess are apparently very rare. So I'm going to assume that's probably like a thing that you can purchase from the game is a item that allows you to negate the losses that would come from a failed transmutation. So. That's going to probably be a factor into utilizing that service. So you'll get weaponry, but then you'll want to ultimately upgrade the weaponry using transfusion and, or rather enhancements. And that could get a little dicey. Um, yeah. but that's going to be something I have to play with down the line when I'm feeling more comfortable with letting some cron stones go and out the pool <laughs> go. Well, let's talk about this prestige edition. It's 30 bucks. It is available at retail. Uh, it includes the black leopard pet, which I named Predator, obviously. Ooh, uh, it also comes with 2,000 pearls, which is the in-game currency. I'm not sure if you used them yet or not, but I, I personally used them. Uh, they had a sale on inventory slots where you basically got double for the same price, and I, I used my pearls on that. 
I think I'm actually disturbed because you're mentioning pearls. I've never seen a pearl. In fact, that was one funny thing that I've been trying to figure out, which is the damn currency. <laughs> because I'm like, you know, you, you kill enemies, they don't give you money. I go to a shop and they're looking for gold. I'm like, but I don't have any gold. So it's like, okay, here's some items in my inventory. They mentioned a gold, like, in the form of, like, a stack of plates, like, it's worth this much. So I've been selling that stuff here and there, like, just weeds just to watch to see where on the screen the inventory counter would go up. So, okay, based on what I just sold, what was worth 10, did something over here increase by 10? Bam, there it is. I found where the gold is com- I'm communicated, <laughs> which means I also know where pearls are communicated because I did that. But I've never seen anything related to, like, here's a stack of pearls, Perno, just for starting your game off. Like, I haven't come across that. Open your inventory and hit the bumper to go to, like, where the cosmetic items are, and you should have a bunch of promo boxes and goodies in there that you can use. That's where, like, all the value packs are. So you got to open up your inventory and then just switch over to the next menu, and you'll see everything there. Oh. Yeah, it it took me a while to figure out where the hell it was. I was like, where the fuck are my pearls? I want to buy some inventory space. And it took me, again, one of the issues with the game is there's just so much there that it's it's hard to keep track of where everything is. But even yeah. still at 30 bucks, I think this is worth trying out and getting into. Uh, the, the $30 package has like, they say it's a $140 value. I know the game itself is 30 bucks or available on Game Pass. So there's Game Pass for Ray. Uh, I feel what, like with this kind of game, if you're going to buy it for 30 to play it and you're committed to the idea of playing the game, I mean, the average game costs 60 So you may as well just drop 60 being the game plus that con- that cost for that pack of stuff, at least to give yourself something to work with. To well, start the Prestige off. Edition includes the game. So that's just 30 bucks right there. Oh, well, there it is. Yeah. That's not so bad then. Yeah. And it's physical if you want to have a disc on your shelf. But uh, we will talk about this game again next week. We're going to revisit it possibly the week after and maybe the week after. We'll find out. We'll see how uh, how you take to the game and see how long you want to keep doing this. Sounds good to me. Cool beans. He's, but- hoping, he's hoping you do better at sticking with Black Desert than I did sticking to Bless Unleashed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm assuming that Bless Unleashed did not cater, did not take well to you. I didn't take Black Desert for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> it's a desert, baby. <laughs> oh, man. But that is it for this episode. Uh, not a super long one. I'm happy with it. Speed Good run. stuff. You know what that means? <laughs> we got to we got to dec- we got to decimate that going forward. We got to make this show longer. No, longer. no, we don't. Does no, anyone have any final off. words to end it? <laughs> I'm going to read off the first five pages. Of okay, my- so that's a no. Mm-hmm.